Hello, everyone. Welcome to Boston Python, December 16th, 2020. We're going to have a presentation night tonight. We have three speakers. Uh, I have a few things to cover before we jump into that. Uh, let me find. Uh, this is the Boston Python website. It's called about.bostonpython.com. There you can find information about the group, including our code of conduct, which governs all of our interactions, whether online as we are forced to do now, or eventually when we come back together in person. Uh, we want this group to be welcoming and productive for everyone. If at any time you feel like something is amiss, please get in touch with me or one of the other organizers. Um, John Kaparski is an organizer. Uh, Brian Rutledge is an organizer. I don't think right, or he is here. Brian R, I think is Brian. Um, get in touch with one of us um, or send an email to leaders at bostonpython.com and we will make things right. Um, other information on our website is a little out of date. I'd actually be interested if anyone wants to help out, just taking a look through some of those pages and seeing what should be updated. In particular, the physical events that are described there are no longer happening, but we do them online. We could say something about that. I'm kind of excited about the change I made to the site today. Uh, if you'll notice, we now have a thing called office hours. So what we're gonna try to do Every Monday at noon, <clears throat> we will have a Zoom office hour. And I will be there and we'll answer questions, chat, see what's going on, whatever you want to do. Um, the events we run most months are a presentation night like we have tonight. And we also often run a project night, which is two and a half hours. Um, people clumped together by topic. In the physical space, we'd use big round tables, 10 people to a table. On Zoom, we set up breakout rooms for different topics. Those felt a little too infrequent once a month. Um, and they're in the evenings, which maybe some people can't do. And I thought, well, let's take advantage of the virtual world we're living in. It'd be easy for me to take a lunch hour on Mondays and be available on Zoom. Maybe other people would like to do that. It's completely unstructured for now. I know a lot of the questions are going to be about machine learning and data science. I don't know that I can help with that. Um, eventually, I'm going to have to learn about that stuff so I, that I can continue to attend my own meetup because that seems to be where everything's going. But let's see what happens. So maybe someone will come who can answer questions about that. Maybe I'll know some question, answers to that. Maybe other people will. Maybe the questions will be about something else. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. So we're starting next Monday at noon. Uh, there are meetup events about it. I don't announce those events because you get lots of emails every week about uh, office hours, but they are on the meetup page. And it's a repeating event. So it's every Monday from here on out at noon. And the Zoom link is on the meetup page. So let's see what happens. Uh, if we need to eventually split it into different office hours with different topics or figure out a way to organize it better, we will. But we're going to try the simplest thing that can possibly work and see how it goes. Any questions about any of that? Any comments? Any discussion? So for presentation nights, so I mentioned project nights. Project nights are meant to be topic-oriented clusters of people working together, learning from each other, networking, whatever it is you want to do. Presentation nights, like we're about to have right now, <coughs> are uh, presentations by your peers, people, members of the group, about something of interest to them that they think will be of interest to you. And there's really no more rules about it than that. It doesn't have to be an expert talk. It doesn't have to be about some awesome thing that you built and no one else could have possibly built because you're a super genius. <coughs> it does, you don't even have to know the whole topic when you agree to do the talk. Um, it could be about a project that you've started, but you're halfway through and you can use help. Um, it's all, what's going on back there? There's all, okay, that's actual. That's great. That's great. Whoever is doing that, please stop. Chip, is that you, Martin? It looks like Arana. Okay. Um, Somebody brought their garage band. I should, I should learn how to use the mute all button or shortcut, but I don't know how to do it. And I don't feel like trying to find it in the menu. Um, <clears throat> as I alluded to in some of our pre-chat, um, I will 
come and talk to people and say, I think you personally could do a talk. And the person will usually say, ah, come on. And we'll talk for a while and we'll find a topic for them. Um, if you have any inkling at all that you might possibly want to maybe someday ever in some sort of way give a presentation, please get in touch with me. I will help you. I will do whatever it is that we need to do to get you in front of people. I, I fight every day. Um, and I fight for, for five are you going to share the comment? Hold on a second. How does this work? Does anyone know the shortcut to mute everyone? You all. Oh, I think I mean, it's just it seems to be useful. Um, sorry. Um, I will find you a topic. At the last project night, there was a person who had written a program, and it seemed very clear that they weren't really excited about presenting it. And I said, I will do the presentation of the program that you wrote, and then you can just show up and take a bow at the end. How about that? Like I am, if you think I am not interested in you getting your work in front of people and me doing part of the work for you, you are wrong. I will help you with this. So, um, <clears throat> and you may have heard Joanna earlier say that the uh, her rating of her presentation, her, her uh, impression of doing that presentation was that it was an 11 out of 10. She enjoyed it. Everyone always enjoys it. You should do it. Um, before we jump into our presentation, let me say just one more thing about the website I'm sharing here. There's a link to Slack. Um, we have a Slack workspace. It's super quiet, but if you need some help with something and you go in there, people will help you. There's also an organizing channel where we occasionally discuss how the group is run. For instance, over the weekend, I was mulling over this idea of office hours and some people chimed in and said, what about this? And I said, hmm, how, how about that? Um, and we ended up with the office hours that we're going to be doing starting next month. So if you're interested in how the group works, or if you have an idea, or if you'd like to see something happen and you don't know how to make it happen, but you think it would be great, come and talk to us there. Um, I know people are on Slack a lot and on Zoom lock a lot, and it's kind of the tools we have available to us. And I'm sorry that I'm inviting you to do yet more of that stuff, um, but it's at, least, at least it's not work. I can't fire you. I also can't give you a raise. But so there's the pros and cons. Come and join us on the Boston Python Slack and make the group be what you want it to be. All right, anything, anything else about any of that? Um, does anyone want to say anything? I have muted everyone, but you can unmute your, yourselves if you have something to say. Um, about the, so the about.bostonpython.com website, by the way, um, it is a GitHub Pages site. So at the bottom um, of each page is edit this page on GitHub. And it could be an interesting way to actually learn a little bit more about how GitHub or pull requests work, um, the process of contributing with strangers to an open source project in a simple way. Since there's no coding, there's no tests that can fail. It's mostly just typing English sent words. Um, so if you'd like to help with that, that's a simple way to get started. OK, I'm going to stop sharing. And we are going to go to our first presenter, who is Pete. We're going to go Pete, Ruth, Heather, if that works for everyone. That's the order that was on the event page. Works for me. So should I just share my screen now, Ned? Yes, although I'm going to guess that you cannot. One second. There you go. Do that. OK, so let's see. Share screen, and then can, can you see the uh, PowerPoint presentation? No. OK, let me try to, oh wait, I think I actually have to hit share. How wait. about now? Yes. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about yourself first, unless you're oh, yeah. going to do that. All right, absolutely. So my name is Pete Mangione, and I'm actually a full-time meteorologist at a TV station here in Providence, Rhode Island. And how fitting is it for me to give a presentation when we have a huge snowstorm on the way? So uh, I actually knew a month ago that on this night, we'd have a big snowstorm. So I asked Ned specifically for this night. Kidding, obviously. but. Um, <laughs> No, I'm excited to talk about weather. And I actually, in the late 90s, was a full-time computer consultant and programmer. And I left the programming field full-time in 2001 and went to grad school at Penn State for meteorology. But 
for the entire time I've been a meteorologist, I've always been interested in programming, especially weather data. So I do a lot of uh, projects on the side and actually have a couple of websites, which of course relate to weather. All right, and away we go. All right, so the title of my presentation is called Building a Virtual Rain Gauge. And for those of you that are interested in um, seeing the code, because I'm not gonna actually go through that much of the code tonight, but if you're interested in looking at it or running it yourself, um, you can go to that uh, address that you see there on the top. Um, I do know that... By the way, I'll just point out that I'm, I'm gonna be asking all three of our presenters to post their slides as comments on the Meetup event page. So if something goes by too fast, don't worry, you'll be able to get the slides afterwards and whatever information's on the slides you'll have. Okay, excellent. And, and by the way, I know that like some of the faces, the videos of you guys are like blocking part of the slide. Is everyone able to see most of it? We can see the whole thing. All right, excellent. All right. So anyway, um, this script, I know it works with Python 3.4. I also know because I was playing around with some of the more recent versions, it does not work on some of the more recent versions. I'm not sure why, but anyway, just so you're aware of that, if you want to run the script or tweak it or play around with it. Um, and my next adventure, I think, will be to learn pandas because I think what I'm about to show you would be much easier done using something like pandas. All right, so here is the problem. Uh, as a meteorologist, predicting the future is complicated enough, but often even finding out what has already happened can be even more complicated. And so let's say that you live at that location at the red dot in Massachusetts. And let's say you're interested in how much it rained over the past week or the past month. Maybe it's because you wanna know how much to water your lawn. Maybe you're just a weather nerd like me and you're interested in, in rainfall. So, you know, Boston Logan Airport and airports across the country have great rainfall data. It's quality checked, it's there every day, it's reliable, but sometimes the airport is not actually that close to your address. So sometimes, you know, that's just too far. That's not gonna work. Now we have this network of volunteer reports that we can access, but the problem with those is sometimes there's missing data. Maybe the person that is volunteering slept in and uh, forgot to file a report. So that doesn't work either. So the script that I built, the purpose of it is to actually find a weather station that's close, but is also complete. So essentially we're looking for the closest recording rain gauge that does not have missing data. And the data source that I pull this data from is actually called Coco Ross. It's not a breakfast cereal, okay? This is a volunteer weather network. It actually stands for Community collaborative rain, hail, and snow network. And this is actually an amazing network. It's made of tens of thousands of volunteers that file reports daily, usually from their backyards. Um, and if any of you are interested in becoming a spotter, they're always looking for more people. If you've ever heard of something called the US Drought Monitor, they issue reports weekly about where there's drought in the United States, and they rely heavily on these volunteer reports because, you know, if we just have the rainfall reports at airports, there are huge gaps in between that data. So these volunteer reports are critical in um, figuring out how much it rains. This is actually a snapshot of all the volunteer reports from the Coco Ross network on October 14th. So it's possible you may have a Coco Ross weather spotter living right down the street and you never knew it. So during this presentation, when I use the term weather station, I'm basically just talking about a rain gauge that would look like this. So this is a typical setup for a Coco Ross weather spotter. They'll have a weather station like this in their backyard. Um, I don't think everyone in the network lives on a beautiful farm-like scene like this, but the setup is similar. They'll have a rain gauge in their backyard or their porch basically anywhere where you don't have interference from building or structures or something that could interfere with the rain hitting the rain gauge. Another important thing to point out is this is recorded by humans, all right? This is not an automated station. As much as we love data automation, 
in the world of meteorology, often a set of human eyes are better than automated data. So essentially the person, whoever the volunteer is, goes out to the rain gauge in the morning, they take their phone, they put their rainfall on the, the Coco Raz app, they empty out the rain gauge, set it back up and wait for the next day of rainfall. So it's really kind of a simple system, but it's really, really useful and it really helps meteorologists and other environmental scientists. So my script gets the Coco Raz data from an API. Now, technically I'm not actually sure if it's an API because this is the only API I've ever used where I don't need a key. Normally, you know, you sign up for a key and you use it that way. For some reason, you don't have to do it with this particular API, but fair enough, it behaves like an API. It returns the data in JSON format. So we'll just call it an API. Um, and the URL string we need to build to get the data is pretty simple. Now for this example, because I live in Rhode Island and Rhode Island's a small state, so it makes it easier to get the data, we'll go with Rhode Island. So it needs a state, in this case, state equals RI or Rhode Island, a start date and end date. And a start date and end date are basically the range of dates in which we want the rainfall. So this URL string would basically ask the API for the rainfall data for all the weather stations in Rhode Island from October 13th to October 14th. And the user of the script, which really could be any of you, basically anyone interested in how much rain fell at their home address, just has to give it three strings, their address, the start date and the end date. Now I live near the Providence Place Mall. So I'm using the address of the Providence Place Mall for this example. I don't actually live at the mall, but I live close enough. And I thought that would be a good thing to use for this example. All right, um, you'll see this image a few times in this presentation, bunch of Austin Python. And what that means, and this is actually good news for all of you, is that it means I'm gonna skip over the code and just kind of tell you the concepts of what I'm trying to do. So instead of jumping around in my scripts, which I think could take all night, I'll just tell you that I wrote some code, which in my opinion could be awesome, maybe not. And it gives us the URL string. Now, for those of you that are beginner or intermediate Python programmers, you could probably figure out how to get from those three strings at the top to that URL string at the bottom in a relatively short amount of time. All right, so the URL will access the Coco Raz API, and that API is going to give us back a list of dictionaries. Now, this confused me a lot at first because I thought even dictionaries, which were not in lists, were pretty confusing, let alone a list of dictionaries. So briefly, we'll just review lists. And I'm not going to make you sit here and listen to me read all these rules. But by the way, this is a great resource for uh, programming that I found. I, I find it's very useful, w3school.com. Anyway, here are a few of their rules for making lists. You can look at them, absorb them. I thought it might be fun just as a quick example, let's make a list out of their rules. All right, so we put brackets around it, which I've highlighted in red. We put commas there in blue, and now we've built a list of strings. So there's item one of the list, there's item two of the list, and there's item three. All right, fair enough. Now dictionaries are a little bit different. They're used to store data values and key value pairs. Um, a dictionary is a collection which is unordered, changeable, does not allow duplicates. A little bit of an aside about the duplicate, when I was reading this just to kind of play around with it, it actually let me build a dictionary with a duplicate, but you know, I expected to get an error. I didn't get an error, but I think you generally don't wanna do that because you're gonna get back a result or a value that you might not be expecting. It wouldn't make sense to build a dictionary with a duplicate, but I thought that was interesting that at least the, uh, the the interpreter allowed me to do it. I thought that I might get an error. Anyway. Just as a point of clarification, I think what, yes. W3, what W3 schools meant was you couldn't have duplicate keys. And probably what you had done was you had created duplicate values. I Now, Ned, I swear, and I should find the code. I swear <laughs> I had duplicate keys. I swear. Oh. I, I, well, but maybe not. You might be right. You, you made the unicorn dictionary and, and <laughs> that is going to be your next presentation is how you did it. 
<laughs> there we go. I already have presentation number two. All right, fair enough. Yeah, it's it's possible that I actually was not able to accomplish that. But okay. uh, anyway, so just for fun, I made a dictionary out of these rules about dictionaries. So we put the curly brackets, which you do when you build a dictionary, and then your key value pairs are separated by a colon. So we have a key of rule one, and then the value is the actual rule for rule one, same thing for rule two and rule three. And you know, these are useful because if you want to reference something, if you wanted to, for instance, print out rule three, you would put in the Python syntax to say, okay, I wanna print out uh, the dictionary for, I wanna print out the key of rule three for a dictionary and it would print out this value. So let's now show you what the list of dictionaries looks like. So now, and again, on first glance, this almost looks like I'm building a dictionary with a duplicate key, but this is actually a list of dictionaries. So again, this took me a long time to kind of conceptualize and comprehend where we actually have one dictionary there, second dictionary there, and the third dictionary there. So that's why we're not actually using duplicate keys because each one is a separate dictionary in a list. So this is a list of three dictionaries. Now, let's talk about the weather data that's actually coming back from Cocoa Ross, from the Cocoa Ross API. Now, if I was gonna pull back all of the Rhode Island data, it would be much longer than this, but just to keep things simple, I'm just showing you the first two items, the first two list items of what's returned. And I've just put that red bracket with a zero and one just to show you the index number of the list. So we have the zero index representing the first list item, and the one index representing the second. And there's a lot of information there. So let's actually go into the first dictionary or the first list item and break it down. So again, all these, this is a dictionary. This is now one dictionary we're looking at. And the first dictionary returned from the Cocoa Raz API is simply an observation. So it's an observation for a particular date at a particular weather station. And some of this stuff is kind of self-explanatory, right? The key of observation date is the date that the observation was recorded. Um, this ST underscore number, the station number, that's important because um, when I was initially building the script, I actually thought that the station name, which in this case is Manville, 0 0.4 West Southwest, I thought that looked specific enough to be unique but it turns out it wasn't. It turns out there are some situations where you can have two different stations with the same name. And it actually caused me several weeks of frustration before I figure that out. So it was good that I realized that the station number was the actual unique identifier for the weather station. That ID field at the top, I think what that's doing is that's uniquely identifying this entire combination of data you know, I think for some programs, you would need that for this particular presentation and example. We don't need to worry about that. And of course, total PCPN, that is the total precipitation that was recorded for that day at this weather station. And I should point out, even though I'm using the term rainfall a lot in this presentation, precipitation actually includes both rain and melted snow. So for instance, if we were running my script and a few days looking back at what's going to happen tomorrow, that would be pretty much all melted snow and not much rain. So, so Pete, can you hear me? Yes. So do the observers, when they get a snowstorm and they've got this rain gauge and it's full of snow, what do they do? How do they record that? So what they do is they actually, so the Kokoraz network not only measures rainfall, they're actually trained uh, snow spotters as well. And they'll actually melt down the snow. And what they're supposed to do is record the liquid equivalent of the snow that fell. Oh, so they actually, okay, all right. Yeah, so you could make this program that I'm talking about, I think I could call up the API in a different way to actually look for snowfall totals instead of rainfall totals. So okay. the volunteers also record, record snowfall, which is, which is also helpful. Good question though, love the weather questions. <laughs> All right, so, um, so the main challenge that I ran into when I was making this was 
figuring out how to deal with the missing data. Because again, these are volunteers. Sometimes they maybe are on vacation. They wake up late. They don't feel like going out there and looking at the rain gauge. So I made this dictionary called Number of Days Station and Rainfall Report Dictionary. Now, I know the variable name seems a little long. That's kind of how I like to name variables. It allows me to follow my code a bit easier. And this dictionary basically just keeps track of the number of observations for each weather station. And this will help us sort out the missing data. So here's how that works. So let's pretend we're just, we just have five observations returned from the API. I'm gonna keep things simple. So our first weather station name is called Barrington, 1.3 West Northwest with the station number of RIBR5. So we go into the loop and then I basically have the program grab the station number key or reference the station number key, grab the corresponding value, which in this case is RIBR5, and then put that as the key to our new dictionary. Now, if this key is going into this dictionary for the first time, the value is assumed to be zero, and we just add one to it. So let's now loop to the second item. Now we have the same weather station, just a different date. Instead of October 14th, we have October 13th. Same weather station though, same location, RIBR5. So now we're gonna access the station number key, look for the corresponding value, which is RIBR5. Now, if this key already exists in our dictionary, then we're just gonna add one to whatever, whatever value is there. So in that case, that's two. All right, and then we're gonna do the same thing for this other weather station. So this is now a new weather station. This is RIBR11. The first time it goes in, it's one. The second time it goes in, it's gonna be two. So you can see what we're doing. We're just counting the number of times the station number appears in our list of dictionaries. Finally, we get to Foster, Rhode Island, a beautiful town, by the way. And that has a station number of RIBR22. So because that currently doesn't exist in our dictionary, we look it up. If it's not there, we're gonna put a value of one. So now we have this dictionary. And again, if I was pulling back data for all of Rhode Island, this dictionary would be much, much longer with a lot more keys and a lot more values. But in this case, we'll just look at this uh, three, three pairs of key values. So remember, the user enters two dates, the start date and the end date. In this example, it's October 13th, October 14th. So I basically just wrote a formula, which in Python is fairly easy, that will give you um, it'll basically subtract one date from the other one and add one. And that will give you basically the number of days required for each weather station to show that it doesn't have missing data. So for example, October 13th minus October, sorry, October 14th minus October 13th is one. You add one, that's two, because we have two dates, October 13th, October 14th. If, if we put a rain, if we put in a range of October 13th to October 15th, well, then that would be three days required of observations, right? Because we need the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. So that's how we calculate that. So now we have this dictionary on the left, which has the number of days each weather station is reporting. And on the right, we have that requirement. How many days need to be reported for this weather station to be considered not missing? And that's how we basically toss out the values that are missing. So in this case, because we need each weather station to have two dates of reports, that one with a value of one gets tossed out. We say goodbye to it. Nothing against the town of Foster, Rhode Island. Um, and then once you do that, the rest of it, you know, is fairly simple. Now we know which stations have missing data. We know which stations do not have missing data. And now we can basically just add up the rainfall totals for each weather station. So um, the end result is an object like you see here on the bottom of the screen, which has a station name, the station number, and then the total precipitation. But now we have an object which actually has all the precipitation for all the dates, not just one day, which is what we want, right? We want the total rainfall for the nearest weather station of our address. Um, just to visually show you how this works, for instance, the first two rows, which are highlighted there in blue, you can see they're both coming from Barrington, 1.3 West Northwest. So you just add up that precipitation value, the total PCPN, 
and you get that total precipitation on the bottom there in our object. Uh, same thing for the Bristol station, which I've highlighted in blue. You add up the total PCPN numbers and you end up with that total precipitation on the bottom. Um, and Foster, sorry, you only have one date of observation. You're not making the cut. You don't get an object. So that's basically how I, I parsed out the missing data. Now, one thing I kind of glossed over before is you also may notice in this object, I have this distance from home station value, which is, which is in miles. And that actually was fairly easy to calculate. Um, what I didn't show you before is that when we loop through this list of dictionaries from the Coco Raz API, it actually does give you a latitude and longitude for each observation. I just didn't include it before because I didn't want to clutter up the screen. But as we loop through, we can just make a variable on the fly during our loop called station location, which is a tuple of floats, by the way. And of course, this is not terribly complicated either. For our home address, we do a bunch of offs in Python, which I think is just a few lines, and you end up with the coordinates for your home station. And there is a cool method, which I wasn't aware of before, but now I am called great circle, where you basically just put in your two sets of latitude and longitude coordinates, and it basically calculates the distance between the two. In this case, it's Bristol, Rhode Island, and Providence, Rhode Island, and that distance would be 10.97. So, you know, normally, if we're looking at all of Rhode Island, we'd have hundreds of objects. In this case, we just have two, but our program is going to pick the one that's closer because, again, we want the closest um, weather station with complete data. Now, one final step is I'm going to actually run this now, or I ran it before with real data. So when I run it, it's simple. We put in the address we want, Providence Place Mall, starting date, end date. And normally, the program works with just returning one line. This is what you see. And th that's actual data. So I actually ran that from uh, a rain event we had from October 13th to October 14th. And the closest weather station actually came from Providence. It's a distance of 1.18. I thought the distance was important to include because let's say you don't for whatever reason, live near any weather volunteers, and let's say the distance away is 11 miles. Well, then you might think, well, maybe this rainfall number is not so accurate. Um, on a map, it kind of looks like this. That blue house thing is the Providence Place Mall, and that volunteer report is actually coming from about a mile away. That's far. And I think on my GitHub page, I actually set it up to print out the five closest weather stations if that was interesting. So again, we have that closest weather station at the beginning, which is a little over a mile away, but then I also print out a few additional uh, observations. And of course they get progressively further away because I actually sorted it by the, the distance that they're away from our home address. Um, this script should work for any state. So those of you in Massachusetts should be able to run it for an address in Massachusetts. I've tried it in Florida. So uh, feel free to, to, to play around with it. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. All right, do we have questions? So if you, if you haven't noticed, by the way, in the chat, we've had a very informative back channel of commentary um, with some details about the API, some other pointers to other places in Python of bits and pieces that might be useful. Um, does anyone have any questions for Pete? Yeah, I have a maybe mm -hmm. stupid question, but uh, for the volunteers, yep. um, are they supposed to take the measurement at set hours? Yeah, good. No, that's actually a really good question. So, so yes, they generally are encouraged to report um, at, I think, between like 6, 7, or 8 o'clock in the morning. And I think they do it that way because they wanted to find a common time when most people would be able to do it. Um, you know, if the report is late, it's usually flagged and it might even say this report came in at 2 p.m. But they're supposed to report fairly early in the morning. Um, it's interesting because when you combine these volunteer reports with data from the National Weather Service, 
it can be a little confusing because the airports and their observations at midnight, weather spotters record basically a 24 hour period from 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. So if you were to look at a map of this, the volunteer reports are staggered from, from the airport data. But good question though. Uh, sorry, I had a follow up. So do you do you in your script have to account for for that kind of difference? So I could I don't I just I just kept it really, really simple. I just basically, you know, if, if the report is filed for the date, I accept it. Um, I think and I, I haven't investigated this thoroughly. I think that if someone puts in the report at two in the afternoon, um, the precipitation total will show up as a weird value, like minus 2.0 or something, something like that. So I don't think a report that's filed in the afternoon would actually make it into my script, or, or it shouldn't. Thank you. Yeah, no, good question. Any other questions for Pete? Pete, I was kind of hoping you'd be standing in front of a green screen waving at the code. You know, the this? way weathermen do. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was, I, I could probably actually do something like that, right? I mean, you've done a good job with your background. Come, come with, just put my coat as the background and start standing around. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question. Um, Does anybody ever uh, in the weather circles ever try to interpolate these various data points by smoothing some of the data and trying to guess what the precipitation total is between stations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, I, I did a little part-time work with a company years ago that actually was involved in dam regulations. So they were trying to figure out, you know, where in history there have been really big rainstorms and where someone might need to upgrade or, or raise the dam in certain areas. And they really needed to plot historical rainfall. So what they would do is they would actually take human observations combine it with airport observations, and then combine it with things like um, radar, because radar can actually give you an algorithm which tries to interpolate past rainfall. So for instance, you could look up the radar from yesterday and look at how much the radar thinks it rains pretty much everywhere. Um, the problem is sometimes that radar estimate isn't always as accurate as something that's measured on the ground. Yeah. But, but there are people and companies that are always trying to interpolate things like that, yes. Just to chime in, I used to work at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology and I spent yeah. two years working on this exact problem as a research scientist. And the other thing that you have to consider when you're trying to interpolate rainfall is not just like smoothing interpolation, but you have to look at orography because that will, you know, rain will rain on one side of a mountain versus another. But you also have to look at um, the prevailing winds as well as to like where the rain is coming from. Um, so it's, it's a really it's it's a really difficult problem to, to actually solve. Yes, I'm glad there's someone that understands. Yes, it is very difficult, <laughs> which which again was frustrating because I think the history should be easy and the future prediction should be the hard stuff. But it turns out the history is almost just as hard sometimes. It's all hard. It's all yeah. very hard. Absolutely. There's, there's one last question in the chat, which is instead of melting the snow, why doesn't the volunteer weigh the snow? You know what? I think they, they might do that. I should actually look up their snowfall measuring procedures. Um, I mean, you could, do, you could do all kinds of things with it, right? Um, no, that's a good question. And, and you know, if for a volunteer that wants to get really, really specific, I think they do have observation notes. So sometimes I'll go on to the, the actual Coco Raz website and you'll see observation notes that, hey, I'm seeing huge flakes here. Or I'm seeing, you know, even though it rained one inch today, most of the rain fell in the last 10 minutes. So, um, you know, they have some very detailed observers in that network. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Pete. It's uh, it's clear that people are interested in the weather aspects of this just as much as the Python aspects, maybe even more since it's the unfamiliar part to most of us. We have never delved into these things. Um, but thank you very much. Um, Ned, you have one more. There was one more question, actually. I, 
So as a newer user, I'm kind of dumbfounded about how people actually find like the methods that are out there that aren't part of the standard collection. So how did you find Great Circle, Pete? You know what? I, I'm pretty sure I went on Google and looked <laughs> up how to find distance between latitude and longitude. And I think I remember getting annoyed and frustrated because the answers seemed overly complex. So then I went to my next best teacher, YouTube, and I just, I put in the same thing and there was just, there was some guy that like just typed it out. Okay. What, what Pete yeah. just said was that he is a professional software engineer. Basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is what we do. <laughs> it's sometimes it's the best way, right? That's what, what else are you going to do? All yeah. right. Thank you very much, Pete. So Pete, you mentioned you. your, your next foray here would be to be using Pandas. Uh, and we've got Ruth here to tell us something about Pandas. So Pete, if you unshare your screen, Ruth will be able to share. Yep. All right. I'm going to, sh can you hear me? Yep. Share. Okay. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yep. Okay. All right, so I'm Ruth and um, I'm gonna give a little, this is a lightning talk, so it should be just about 10 minutes or so about um, solving one of the advent of code puzzles using a Pandas data frame. And this came about because um, Ned got me interested in advent of code and I mentioned to him that I was using Pandas and he said, oh, that's interesting. And so he thought people might be interested um, if you weren't familiar with Pandas. So this is really for people who aren't familiar with Pandas. Um, my background is I just started, I'm really new to Python. I just started last summer coding in Python, but I started with data science. So I've been using Pandas all along. So I'm really, that's sort of what, what my go-to is actually. So a little background on Pandas. Um, Pandas data structures are built on top of NumPy arrays. So it's a, it's a uh, package and there's two main data structures. The first is a series, which is one dimensional. And the second is a data frame, which is a two dimensional um, and both of them have labeled indices and columns, uh, can be labeled, don't have to be by default, they'll just be given integers. So they're really easy to access because your code looks really nicely because you're referring to columns and rows by names. Um, they can hold uh, mixed data types, so they can hold kind of, you know, what um, Pete was talking about, they can hold lists of lists and dictionaries of lists and all, all sorts of different um, types of data. And they have many, many methods. Um, because they was written for data science, they're just got a lot of methods for filtering, cleaning, joining, um, you know, anything you can think of doing in SQL, you can do with a pandas data frame plus more. And I'm just gonna show you a few of those tonight, um, just to give you an introduction to, to how a data frame works. So, um, and we're gonna look at the advent of code. We're gonna actually look at the advent of code if you don't know it. I'm, I'm new to it this year and it's been really fun. Um, it's created by Eric Wassel and he releases a puzzle at midnight Eastern Standard Time every day during the month of December through Christmas day. And um, he releases each puzzle has two parts. And so there are statistics about who's completed, you know, how many people have completed part one and part two. Part two is obviously a lot harder than part one and the puzzles get harder as the month goes on. Um, and at the beginning, there were 100,000 players, over 100,000 players the first day. And now I think we're down to today about 25,000 or so last time I checked. So people are definitely, it's definitely a, a uh, stamina. It's kind of a marathon thing to keep going with it. And it takes me a long time because I don't have a lot of years of programming. So um, anyway, so we're going to look at day two because I didn't want to get wrapped up in all the logic of some of the later puzzles. So we're going to look at sort of day two, which is one of the earlier days. So I'm actually gonna show you my um, Jupyter notebook where I did this. And um, I won't go into the background of the puzzle. There's a story involved in it, but I'm just gonna show you the, the uh, actual puzzle, which is we have this data right here and we've got three columns of data. And the first column is a range of numbers. The second column is a letter and the third column is a password. And you have to decide which of these passwords, how many of these passwords are valid. Can you make the type a little bit bigger? Can I make it bigger? Sure. Yeah. How's that? Yeah, better. Thank you. Okay, let's go a little bigger. Is that better? Ooh, very nice. Okay. Okay. So our first one is our first one is the range of values, and the second one is a letter, and the third one is the password. 
So what you have to decide is how many of these are valid. And the rules for this are really simple. And by the way, I'm probably just going to get through part one on this puzzle because I think that's the majority of what, what I want to explain, what I want to show you guys. So uh, part one, what, what we do is we look at this and we say A has to be contained in this password at least one and at most three times. And so this password is valid because A is contained one time. And this next password is not valid because B is not contained between one and three times. And the next password is, is valid because C is actually contained nine times and that falls within this range. But our actual test file, that's just an example, our actual test file for everyone gets their own individual input in, the, in this competition, by the way. And the, my actual test file looked like this. So it's quite long. And as, I, as if you were on the beginning of the call, you heard that for some of these puzzles, performance gets to be quite an issue. And some of them you actually have had to rewrite code completely to get it to complete in a reasonable amount of time. Ruth, for whatever reason, we couldn't see your input. It sounded like you were trying to show us the file, but we didn't see oh, it. Oh, because I'm not, that's not in my Chrome window. I think I'd have to switch my sharing. It's its like a hundred lines and it's very, yeah. very long. There's no way you could eyeball it. And yeah, it's just, it's like minutes. this, but it's, its I think it's, I think this one's a couple hundred lines long yeah. and the passwords themselves are very, very long. And so as you, you often get sample code to test on, but then you have your actual input code is so big that there's no way you could walk through it. So you have to make sure your code is running correctly before you can actually use your actual input code. So we're just gonna go through, um, you'll see my input code after I read it in. So the first thing I'm gonna do is import my package, which is pandas. And by convention, pandas is always imported as PD. And the next thing we're gonna do is read uh, the CSV file. Now pandas has a lot of really nice file IO because data scientists do a lot of that. So there's a read Excel a function, a read PS CSV function. You can read HTML tables, things like that. And these are pretty configurable. And we're going to specify that um, we're going to read in our data and specify that the separator is a space in this case, not a comma, actually. And you can say whether you have a header, whether you have an index column, what your columns are, things like that. And so we're going to read it in, and that goes directly into a data frame, which is really nice. And we can look at the shape of our data frame. Again, the data frames are going to have all the same attributes that NumPy arrays do, but then they're going to have a lot more to them. So this is the same as a NumPy shape, and we're going to get um, that we have a thousand rows and three columns. And I should mention that data frames are usually used in data science, that the columns are often your attributes and your features, and your rows are your observations. And typically, like in this case, we're going to look at the beginning of our data, and we'll see that here we have our, these are the first five rows of our data. Our columns, were, because we didn't have column names in our text file, they were just given numbers of 0, 1, 2, and our index was just given numbers. Um, but if you had, for example, instances of an observation for every town in a, in a county, or if you had time series data, you might want to make your index to be one of your columns, to be the time stamp or to be the state or the county or whatever your, whatever that was. But I should mention that indexes don't have to be unique. So you can get kind of tripped up if you're merging and joining data and you're not keeping track of your index indices. So the first thing I want to do with this data, so we see that we have some data here. I want to name the columns so that it's going to be easier to access. So I'm going to name my columns by just Menu and columns. I'm going to name this one range and this one letter and this one password. And then I'll use this method called info, which is really nice. And Pete, this would be super helpful for you because info tells you how many null and non null values you have. And one thing data scientists do is deal, ton, deal a lot with null values how many you have, where they are, are there patterns, um, you know, what to do about them. So info just gives you a nice sense when you first look at some data as to how many null and non null values you have. So now we'll look at our data again, and we'll see that we have our nice columns here called range, letter, and password. And I'm just going to show you a couple of ways you can access your data. You, you can pick out a row by using the um, name of the index, the value of the index. So we can pick out this second row here, and we see that we see that here. We can pick out a column by just passing it in brackets. You can pick out a column. So we're going to look at the password column, and we're going to see that here. And we can filter the rows really easily. So let's say we want to see all the columns where we have an S, all the rows, and I'm sorry, where we have an S in the password. So what we're going to do is we're going to just create a filter by passing a string function to the password column. 
And we're going to say, how many times does the letter S appear in the password? And if it's greater than zero, we're going to get a true or false. So we're going to get a Boolean mask from this. And then we can use that Boolean mask to filter our data frame. So we pass that same Boolean mask into our data frame here. And now we're seeing just the rows where we have at least one instance of the letter S. So it's a really easy way to filter, to filter your data. And if we wanted to not see all the, all the columns and we wanted to just see some of the columns for those filtered rows, we can just pass it afterward the names of the columns that we want to see. So we're going to pass it range and letter. And now we only see those two columns for those filtered rows. Um, so back to the problem, what we want to do is actually look at our data, which is here. And what we want to do is figure out, OK, which of these are valid? So I'm going to add some columns to my data frame. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split this range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a string method to it which is gonna split it and I'm gonna re get return from that because I've expand, I'm gonna get two series back and I'm just gonna assign them to a new column. So I'm gonna get a minimum range and a maximum range column in my data frame. I'm also gonna also strip off this colon from the letter because I don't need that there and I wanna be able to match on the letter. Then I'm gonna drop this first column because I don't need it anymore. And I'm gonna change these minimum range and maximum ranges to ints because I wanna be able to do um, integer comparison on them. So after we do all that, the data looks like this. So we now have a letter column and a minimum range and a maximum range. And now that we have some numerical data, we can use a really nice method that a data frame has, which is the describe method. And the describe method will give you statistical analysis of any numerical columns you have. So it doesn't mean much here, but we can see that we have for a minimum range and maximum range, we have it automatically gives me my mean, my standard deviation, my percentiles, things like that. And there are lots of nice methods like that for, for looking at data. Okay, so now we need to look in here and we need to see how many times does each letter actually appear in this password. So what I'm gonna do, and as I mentioned that the data frame, there's two structures, a data frame and a series, and a data frame is actually, each column in a data frame is a series. So a data frame is very quick to, to access by column. It's actually the transpose of how a NumPy, NumPy array is organized. And so you, don't, you want to avoid iterating over a data frame, iterating over the rows if possible, because that tends to be really slow. So we're going to apply instead a lambda function here. And this lambda function is going to take each row, which is x, and it's going to take the password for that row it's going to count the letters in that row. And the axis equals one means that we're going to apply that to each row in the data frame because you can apply functions to rows or columns. So axis equals one means each row we're going to apply this and we're going to end up with a letter count. So now we see that we have the letter count, that we see that the letter T appears once in here, the letter L appears seven times in this password. And so now we can, now we can easily look and see which of these are valid. And to do that, I just do another lambda function. I apply it across the rows and I look and see where is my letter count within this range, greater than or equal to the minimum range, less than or equal to the maximum range. Again, I do it on an axis equals one. And I see from that, I'm gonna get a Boolean array, which is gonna be trues and false. And I can just apply a sum. So you can chain all these methods, you can chain them and chain them and chain them. And so I can just apply sum to that. And when I get back, Oddly enough, my answer was 666 for this. So that was my number of valid passwords for this input file. And yeah, that was, that was all I had. It was just a quick introduction to Pandas if you were not familiar with it and what you can do with data frames. Any, and thank you very much, Ruth. Any, any questions or comments for Ruth? I, 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 it's not my natural thing to use Pandas or NumPy. The, the few times I have dipped into it, it's felt kind of magical to what I would have thought of as a loop where I do a thing over and over again. I just do the thing to the whole thing all at once, like you did there. It's, uh, it's this kind of magical to me. Um, so we do have a question in the chat about ad advent of code. So I, I'll share um, my screen to show, unless, or you've just unshared. Um, I'll say a little bit more about what advent of code is about. Um, 
this is the current homepage. Um, it's a daily puzzle and the days here have been lit up because we're on the 16th today, days one through 16. This year he's done them in a strange order um, and there's a uh, little under four hours and 30 minutes until puzzle 17 is open because we're four and a half hours from midnight. Um, because I am an obsessive, I have solved both parts of all of the problems so far. So I have two stars on each day. Um, the problems, so if you go and look at the problem, so for instance, day two, you can go and look at, this is the problem that Ruth was just solving. Um, it's got a very uh, retro uh, aesthetic. And the whole thing is based around some goofy story about Santa. This year's story is that Santa's sick of giving out presents. He's going presents. He's going on vacation, and all of his travel difficulties of getting on the plane and taking the shuttle bus and all that stuff. Um, and so it shows you the problem, and you have to put in the answer. And once, not until you put in the answer, does it show you part two. And part two is always based on part one, but with a twist. Sometimes it's, oh, on part one, you iterated a thousand times, now iterate a trillion times. Or, oh, that data you used in part one, it turns out we misinterpreted it and the rules are actually completely different. So you're using the same data, but for a completely different algorithm. And not a completely different algorithm, but used in a different way. And as Ruth mentioned, they get harder over the days. Um, if you look at the stats page, it will show you that 137,000 people got both parts of day one, but only 19,000 people have gotten both parts of day 16. And you can see the, the fall off of the curve here um, as fewer and fewer people have uh, solved the problems. Um, it is super fun. I've been having a blast with it. It is fun. Um, yeah. and, and by the way, there are, so, and, and now there's a leaderboard which is global and people who are solving the problems in a minute and a half, which is about a half the time it takes me to read to the end of the instructions. So I have no idea how they're managing it. Are they really doing it that fast? They are really doing it that, I, yeah, they're really doing it that fast. Oh my gosh. Yeah, exactly. But, but by the way, it's also, it's all, you know, I am asleep at midnight Eastern time. So forget it. I'm not gonna end up on the leaderboard. The good news is that there are actually, you can have private leaderboards. Um, and so for instance, there actually is one um, for, that's been started for Boston Python, which is much smaller. And even if you don't get to the top, you can sort of see how the stars are going for people. If people, if you're interested, um, I'm gonna paste the code to join this uh, leaderboard in the chat. Um, that's the code you'd use on the private leaderboard page to join um, uh, this Boston Python leaderboard, which is called, it's called um, a hacker because Austin Hacker, since it's actually his name, Austin Hacker, uh, started the leaderboard a few years ago and it's just the one we've been using as an group. Um, the other cool thing about Advent of Code is that it actually, it's, this is the sixth year it's been running and all the previous years are still there. So you can actually go and see Advent of Code 2015 and do all those puzzles. They're all available now. You can just binge them if you want. Um, so, and it's a lot of fun. You should try it. For, for beginners who are enjoying uh, starting out, but get like, you know, you might get a week in and then they get really hard and you stop, or um, you might get a few days in. Uh, this means that you have uh, five times as many problems as you thought you had to, to practice on. And if you go through everything you can on the first, you know, the first days of, of each of the years, when you are uh, when you finish with all five or six years and you go back, you'll probably find that, uh, that you've unlocked a few things uh, and you can solve a few more than you thought. So they're really handy that way. And, and are there actually uh, solutions posted somewhere? Because some of my ones, I know that I probably could have done them much more efficiently. Great question. But, yeah. So what I'm sharing here is the, is the advent of code subreddit. So this is uh, a, a, on reddit.com and um, it's full of, I mean, sometimes it's just goofy memes about people trying to solve things. Sometimes it's strange visualizations. Um, sometimes it's really wild visualizations where people actually code up, not just get the answer, but let's 
animate it in some interesting way or something. Um, and I mean, it's just, it's, so if you get into it, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. And there is a, a whole solutions thread um, where you can go and see how people did things. And sometimes it's not so much seeing the code as finding out like, okay, what was the name of the algorithm I needed to have so that I didn't have to do what Elaine did, which is just leave her computer running all day to brute force the thing. Right. Um, and honestly, I'll, I'll full disclosure, day 13 this year, which was the famous one for taking too long, when I saw the problem, I thought, that sounds like something we did in Advent of Code before. And I went and looked through my old code, and I found the name of the algorithm that I only ever learned to do Advent of Code with. And I copied that code over to day 13, read a little bit more on the Wikipedia page, and you know, got a good solution. So it can be a way to learn sort of computer science-y things too. Not necessarily stuff you're gonna use day to day, but you know, education's a good thing, so. I just feel, cause being a new, you know, being new to Python, I feel like it my, I feel like my, just my basic Python skills have improved a lot. Just lists and dictionaries and just using basic data structures have improved a lot just over the last two weeks. Yeah, and what I, what I find is interesting about it is that um, you can, you can choose to use it as a learning tool for whatever it is you're interested in learning. If it's, you know, you might be new to Python or maybe you're a Python expert, but you've heard that Elm is an interesting language. So let's do advent of code in Elm. Or maybe you write a lot of Python, but you wanna get more practice using immutable data structures in Python or more functional programming style in Python or better at classes or name tuples or data classes or whatever it is, or pandas, right? So it can be a really interesting way to just do a little bit, these little problems in whatever style you want. Uh, I've, I've said enough about it. Any other questions for Ruth? Or anyone else about advent of code? All right, well, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Ruth, Ruth is the poster child today for, she joined the group and got roped into doing a presentation and either thought it went okay or is gonna yell at me later about how horrible it was. I'm not sure which, she's smiling now. So I guess it went okay. Uh, Heather, are you ready to go? Maybe we should take a five minute, let's just take five minutes. We'll come back in five minutes. Normally in the middle of an event, we would take a break. We all still have the same biology. So we should probably take a break. We'll be back in five minutes uh, to hear from Heather. Right, Heather? Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Five minutes. People want to chat informally. That's okay, too. I have a question for Pete if he is still here. Don't got a lot of little faces on my screen. I don't see him. I'm here. I'm here. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I didn't answer my question during your uh, talk. But uh, my question is: You said at the beginning of the talk that uh, manual work usually is better with collecting uh, the samples than some automation. So why is automation is harder or does not work as well as uh, manual collection of data? Um, can you, I'm sorry, can you ask that again? I just want to make sure I understand the, the question. Yeah, so you said that uh, people, or you prefer uh, people to collect uh, data from rain stations manually. Oh, but yes instead of uh, doing some automation uh, based on some technologies. Why is that, I think? Right, so for, I mean, obviously automation and automated rainfall stations have value too. The good thing about human observations is you can avoid errors with the rain gauge. Like for instance, if a, if a, if a rain gauge is just sitting out there by itself, uh, if it's cold, maybe, it might freeze, it might tip over, it might be in a spot where it's not actually recording the data properly. And it's good to have an actual person that can look at what's fell in there, empty it out, and make sure that it's in a good position to cleanly 
uh, record the data. It's just generally for rainfall and looking at rain gauges, the, the humans are a little bit more accurate because they can make sure that the, the rain gauge is set up properly. Um, you know, for the rain gauges set up at airports, those are in such um, well put together environments. Those ones would be good, whether it's a human or, or automated, but you know, for, for an automated weather station out there in the woods, you know, something might get clogged in there, something might happen to it, and then you might get a bunch of, of false reports. But if you have a person, they can see if, if the thing is working properly. Good question, though. That might explain some of your missing data. If people are, uh, if some of your observers are getting snakes in the rain gauges, then they probably wouldn't <laughs> report that day. Yeah, they're afraid, right? If you never hear from that station again, you know what happened. The snake won. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Actually, one of the one of the biggest issues is that um, people sometimes will report data when it rains, but when there is no precipitation, they will forget to report zero. But zero is actually important because when you go back and look at years of data, you can't figure out which should be zero and which is missing. So um, actually, if you go into their website, there's a, there's a part of the website that is very clear telling people to make sure you report every single day, even if it's zero. That's why I was thinking that a little bit of, of our summation will do the right thing here. Because oh, yeah. if people are lazy to go out if it's, there is no rain or other things that it, to make sure that there is no missing data, at least for simple cases. Yeah, no doubt. If you, I mean, if, if you had some kind of guarantee that the rain gauge is set up perfectly and that it could empty itself out automatically, then yeah, automation is, is obviously preferable. Um, but in the, in the real world, that's not always the case. But I never thought about snakes in the rain gauge, John. That's, that's uh, very frightening. I think it's a very Australian problem. If it's not snakes, <laughs> it's spiders. No, I think Samuel L. Jackson also has that problem. Yeah. <laughs> snakes in the rain gauge. <laughs> that was my pop culture reference. I've used it up. It's I'm good. done. <laughs> um, all right, so five, we're five minutes in. Uh, Heather is ready to go, correct? Yeah, let me just figure out how to share my screen. And um, start with the PowerPoint here. Ooh, nice. All right, so let me just get... Okay, so tonight, um, quick intro, I'm Heather Kuzmeyers and I am uh, joining you from New Hampshire this evening. If you couldn't tell by the, uh, the flannel here. Uh, so I'm a relatively new add to the group. Uh, I'm an active member up in the New, the new Hampshire Python group. Uh, and Ned uh, very nicely asked if I would present uh, the other month and uh, one goal I had this year was to uh, start working with geospatial data more and try to understand how to work with it and um, uh, tie it to uh, other things that I do, like my hobbies. And I figured this was a good opportunity to be able to kind of consolidate what I've learned and uh, at least introduce uh, all of you to the topic. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a very, very broad and deep topic. So we're just going to skim the surface tonight. And hopefully uh, the takeaway here is that uh, all of you are a little more comfortable with working with it, kind of grease the skids for you to get started. Uh, I'm very much not an expert, so <laughs> bear with me on this. Uh, so yeah, so um, uh, to add a little local flair, you'll notice the uh, Massachusetts map in the background here. So that coastline is gonna factor in here. Um, 
uh, as you know, the Eastern seaboard has, uh, uh, it's kind of a rich history, um, a rich nautical history and Massachusetts really plays into that. And it just so happens that uh, during the golden age of piracy uh, back in the 1700s, uh, there was uh, a pirate uh, named Samuel Bellamy who ran a fleet of ships. And uh, one of those ships was called the Widow Galley. Uh, and as he was making his way up the, uh, the Eastern coastline and plundering ships, uh, he ran into a nor'easter up the coast of Cape Cod, which ultimately grounded the ship and absolutely destroyed it. Uh, so at the time, uh, some local folks got really excited. They're like, oh, there's a pirate ship we can see offshore. This is awesome. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the loot, um, gold, cannons, um, all sorts of that stuff is heavy and it very quickly sank into the sand and with the storm and everything was covered and, uh, and somewhat lost. Uh, very little, if any, was recovered. And um, over time, that story was forgotten. So uh, it turned into local legend. Well, fast forward 260 years and uh, an explorer by the name of Barry Clifford uh, assembled a team and uh, he made it his mission to find the widow. And he, uh, after about um, hundreds of dives off the coast of Cape Cod, they pulled up a bell which had uh, the widow uh, engraved on it. And so um, they found the wreck. Uh, they ended up pulling up over 200,000 artifacts of all pirate paraphernalia, uh, including a little boy's leg, which is <laughs> a little grisly. Um, but uh, internet rumor has it, so this is somewhat unsubstantiated what I'm about to tell you, uh, but um, recently there have been some colonial era documents that were discovered that would indicate uh, the Widaw plundered two additional ships that they didn't know about on its journey before its fateful end. Uh, and unfortunately, um, there are 400,000 gold coins that were unaccounted for in, the, uh, in these artifacts. So uh, keep that in mind as we, um, uh, as tonight, as we're going to look at dive sites and shipwrecks off the coast of Massachusetts is our data sets and uh, go on a little bit of a treasure hunt to find the ship and um, create a map. Uh, we're gonna uh, work with um, certain Python tools, uh, we'll visualize the data and um, get a feel for it. We're going to split uh, the proceeds equally among all the people here. Yeah. If um, if nothing else, maybe you'll be inspired to uh, take up scuba diving. <laughs> so either way, it's um, uh, it's a win-win. All right. So uh, here is um, a roadmap that we're going to walk through tonight. So I kind of hinted at the data set overview. Uh, there's two, two data sets we're going to work with. Uh, I'm going to give you a little more detail on those and explain uh, somewhat why the ship was so hard to find. Um, then we're going to zoom out and go over uh, the geospatial ecosystem. Um, so when I say geospatial data, uh, that can really mean any data that is also packaged with spatial information. So uh, in the form of coordinates. Um, so that's very broad. Uh, and as, as part of our discussion, I want to cover, uh, there's two main uh, formats that are used to package this data that you should be aware of. So I'll cover those um, in some of the common file formats that those, um, uh, those models are packaged in. And, um, and then I'm going to cover, uh, really skim over the, uh, the theory side of things and introduce coordinate reference systems and projections, um, which uh, play into when you're combining data sets and visualizing them. So uh, there are some, some things you got to look out for. Uh, after that, we'll uh, kind of zoom in more and cover the, the handful of Python packages that we're using. Um, this, uh, uh, this evening's other presentations were really fortuitous uh, because we're going to be working in GeoPandas mostly. And that is built on top of Pandas, uh, which Ruth explained. Um, GeoPandas, just uh, a really quick overview. 
is uh, where Pandas introduced the two data structures of uh, a series and a data frame, uh, GeoPandas extends those to create the geo series and the geo data frame, um, where the big difference is there's a new special column that it has, uh, which is called geometry and go figure. It's, um, it's where that spatial information that's in your data is saved. Uh, so that's a, a special one to remember. Um, and it also uses a few other Python packages under the hood, uh, which enabled, um, Pete mentioned great circles this evening. Uh, so fortunately someone else has already implemented uh, calculations like distances, uh, finding the areas of polygons. Um, these are, are things that come up in the geospatial world that you might want to be able to do. So uh, that's under the hood. Um, and then finally, we'll jump over to a Jupyter notebook where uh, I actually um, import the data. Uh, we clean it up a little bit uh, and uh, we create some simple visualizations, but then also create an interactive map that we can uh, look at where that ship, the WIDA, ended up uh, on that fateful day in 1717. Um, all right, so in 20 minutes, uh, we might not hit geospatial enlightenment here, but <laughs> uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, hopefully this gives you just enough info to get started and uh, you know, knowing what to look out for, especially when you inevitably get stuck. So uh, the GIS stack exchange is your friend uh, in these cases. Okay, so data sets. Uh, I mentioned we're going to cover uh, shipwrecks and dive sites. So the shipwrecks are uh, just for Massachusetts, and it's courtesy of a Wikipedia page. Uh, and that came in uh, we're going to talk a little more about um, file formats that are specific to the geospatial world. Um, so a shape file is one of those uh, formats, and that is actually uh, makes it a lot more convenient to work with this data, uh, the fact that it's in that special format. Uh, then we're going to make an API call to a site called divesites.com. And uh, I grabbed all the sites within 75 nautical miles of Boston. Uh, so it does include a handful of sites up in, in Maine and down in Rhode Island, just because of that uh, inaccurate uh, proximity measurement there. Um, and that data is returned in your standard uh, JSON format. So similar to what Pete did, I have to finagle it a little bit to get it to work with GeoPandas. Um, so a little bit of background here too. Um, the reason why the, the WIDA was kind of like a, a very difficult find and lost for so long is because off the coast, uh, along the coast of Cape Cod, there's a 50 mile stretch uh, of coastline that um, uh, it has these naturally occurring uh, underwater features called shoals. Uh, which are kind of like ridges or banks um, made of sand and detritus. So you can't see them and they're constantly shifting, uh, which made navigating, uh, at least back in the days before sonar and radar uh, helped out, uh, very difficult. And um, so this, uh, this stretch of coastline has claimed over 3,000 other ships and uh, is not so affectionately known as the ocean's graveyard or the graveyard of the Atlantic. Uh, so think of trying to find a needle in a stack of needles buried in sand under the water. So uh, hence the 260 year gap there. Okay, so um, I've been referring to this geospatial ecosystem here. Uh, the official term is uh, geographic information system. Um, and, and everything on the slide is uh, not necessarily Python specific. Most of it's not. Um, this is the, uh, think of this as the big picture overview of uh, uh, what you're dealing with when you enter the, the, the GIS world here. So I included a, um, a textbook definition uh, as the subtitle. If, uh, if you can't read it, uh, it says, 
A GIS uh, is a computer-based system that aids in the collection, maintenance, storage, analysis, output, and distribution of spatial data and information. Um, it can include hardware, software, the data itself, um, the actual people working on it, and industry protocols. So that's a lot. Um, that said, when most people refer to GIS in conversation, uh, they're really talking about the software. Um, so if you come across that on a search or anything, it's usually uh, referring to that software there. Uh, so a few acronyms I just wanted to point out on the page that come up a lot um, and, and should help you uh, understand how the different entities work and fit together. Uh, include uh, this Open Geospatial Consortium, the OGC, um, and they are the standards making body for uh, the industry. So think of them like the W3 consortium is to the web. Uh, they're coming up with um, how file format should work, um, how interfaces work, how data is encoded, and they really set the stage for um, everything to work together in this whole environment. Um, over on the, the software side of things, uh, software comes in a few different flavors. Uh, so a few to be aware of, um, there's your standard desktop applications. Um, so this is uh, software with a GUI um, that's again, not Python specific, but uh, you install, you can import uh, file formats, create a map, do all sorts of geospatial analysis and then export things. Um, the, the two most popular ones are QGIS and ArcGIS. Um, QGIS is open source, so it's free. Uh, and hence, that's the one uh, I've used. <laughs> and um, it's actually built in Python. So if you're, uh, if you're looking for a cool open source project um, to contribute to, maybe, maybe keep that one in mind. Um, and then ArcGIS is uh, probably the commercial leader, um, commercial software market leader. So they're very popular and have been around for a long time. Um, and there are many, many others. So, it, you know, the different, the different versions of the software all do and specialize in different things. Uh, next up, uh, I wanted to point out to the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, OSGEO. Uh, they create a number of um, open source projects that really um, implement a lot of those standards that the OGC sets. Uh, so uh, just two worthy of, of noting tonight, um, GDAL and OGRE, uh, which have been combined, uh, is it's actually a C++ command line application. So maybe not the most user-friendly uh, if you don't know C++ um, or you aren't comfortable with the command line, uh, but they implement a lot of file um, IO. So I mentioned um, this, this world has a lot of their special file formats that are just used for geospatial data. Um, they make sure that you can read and write um, those data types. Uh, and then Geos um, implements uh, things like that great circle and other uh, geospatial calculations, um, like those areas of polygons and whether two polygons are adjacent or not. Um, and um, uh, the reason why I wanted to bring these up is because the Python world, fortunately, someone out there has taken that functionality and uh, either wrapped it or re-implemented it in Python. So a lot of this stuff is available for, for us. So we don't have to use C++ command line interfaces, which um, is nice for me at least. Um, and then of course, uh, tonight we'll be uh, talking about Python specific packages. All right, so that's, that's the overview. Um, I mentioned how uh, geospatial data um, comes packaged in different different models. Um, those two models that we really care about, or the two main ones are vector format and roster format. So you're gonna hear those terms probably quite a bit uh, as you dive in here. Um, and then I'll get to data attributes. That was um, <laughs> the, the third worthy of mentioning item. Uh, so uh, vector formats, uh, we're working with a set of shipwrecks in dive sites tonight. 
Uh, so those are um, discrete things that each have a coordinate associated with them. Um, so they're, they're discrete points. Um, so we'll be working with vector data. Uh, it's really good at um, uh, packaging discrete geometries. So when you have a set of points or a set of lines that might re represent a trail system or a railroad network, um, where the, uh, the line is described by a sequence of coordinates. Um, and then polygons are great for uh, describing the boundaries of things. Like um, if you were gonna map all the counties of Massachusetts, then that would come in vector format. Uh, in contrast to that, roster format is better for continuous data. Uh, so we talked about rainfall tonight. Uh, this is uh, an example of how this would be better packaged um, in roster format. Uh, it uses a, a basically a grid system with a coordinate system baked in, so you know where uh, where things are in that that file. Uh, and then for each square on the, the grid, you have your relevant data that's tied to it. So that could be elevation, uh, rainfall, surface temperature, uh, the pixels of the satellite image, um, you name it. Um, so uh, that's roster data is better at, at grabbing <clears throat> that type of information. Um, and then finally, data attributes. Um, Obviously, there's data within vector and roster formats. Uh, this is when you want to kind of supplement what you're doing. So if you're creating a map of those counties of Massachusetts and you have the outlines in your, your vector file, um, if you want to add to that, say, uh, census data like average income per county or um, average age or, or anything, um, you can pull a data attribute table that's tied to a location and, um, and then work with uh, all that data all together within, within your software. Uh, a few um, file formats on the right here. Uh, this list is not exhaustive in any measure. Uh, <laughs> there are, I think, over uh, almost a hundred different vector formats supported in GDAL and Ogre and over 150 roster formats. Um, so uh, this is, like I said, a very small subset. Um, but if you look at this and, say, and see a shapefile or GeoJSON or KML, um, you'll know that you're working with vector data. Um, and likewise, a GeoTIFF or an image would indicate roster format. Um, and then some formats can hold either, like this geo package example here. Um, and uh, data attributes, uh, that's fair game, like any tabular format or even JSON could hold that. So um, uh, one other thing to, to note is uh, vector and roster formats are not exclusive. You can convert one into the other. So it really depends on uh, what you're doing and what you need it for. All right, so, um, all right, <laughs> coordinate reference systems. Uh, oh, this is- oh. Heather, I, there's a lot of information here and I'm, we might be running a little short on time. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure if, if your other slides are as meaty as these, we're, we're not gonna get to them all and I'm not sure how to deal okay. with it. Um, I have uh, coordinate reference systems and projections that I got to go over, and then um, we can jump over to wood, uh, is, if that's okay. So, all right, I'll hit the high points on these. Um, coordinate reference systems, uh, it's uh, really a way to, it's a framework to tie uh, real world places on the surface of the earth uh, to a latitude longitude elevation coordinate um, in a consistent way. Um, the, uh, uh, instead of going into all the details here, uh, the big takeaway here is that there is not just one coordinate reference system, unfortunately, which uh, I naively thought at first. And um, that's based on the fact that uh, to create one, it, it relies on physical measurements of the earth, uh, like taking that the center of the earth out to the equator is, is one distance um, that would go into uh, what's called a datum, 
uh, a set of measurements and assumptions that's used to create these coordinate reference systems. Um, so over time with technology improvements um, and the fact that the earth itself is shifting with tectonic plate movements, uh, we end up with uh, datums and therefore coordinate reference systems that get updated over time. Um, the reason we care about this uh, in uh, working with this type of data is because um, we need to, uh, just like you don't add miles and kilometers together without converting one into the other, uh, it's important to know, you know the coordinate reference system within your data if you're going to combine it with something else uh, because they both need to be on the same system. Uh, so you'd have to convert one into the other. Uh, think of it as like the units of your data. So uh, you need to keep apples to apples. Um, fortunately, in GeoPandas, uh, this is one line of code that, that does a, uh, a conversion for you. So it's easier uh, done than said, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, if you're working in those other special file formats, the CRS will always be embedded in them. Um, and then I just wanted to mention uh, WGS84 uh, is another example of a coordinate reference system. And that shows up with, um, if you're working in GeoJSON, it, part of the spec says that that's what your coordinate reference system is. And uh, any web data, for the most part, um, it's not an official spec, uh, but it's kind of the unofficial default uh, is to use WGS84. Um, so uh, again, key takeaway, uh, if you're combining data sets, it's got to be on the same system. Uh, and likewise, uh, projections are similar. Uh, projection is used in visualization. Uh, it takes 3D coordinates and it converts it into a 2D representation. So think of uh, unrolling this of the earth and then flattening it. And uh, that's a crude description of what a projection does. Um, projections all add distortion. Uh, it depends on, uh, you know, there are different projections that distort and preserve different things. Uh, the key here is that your data, um, if you're combining it with something else, everything needs to be on the same projection when you're visualizing it, uh, which uh, the code will probably uh, explain this a little bit better. So uh, and GeoPandas um, actually uses the same method call to layer on a projection as it does to convert a CRS. So that's pretty convenient. You don't have to remember too much. Um, all right, so I talked about GeoPandas already. Uh, this is another, again, a very small subset of all the uh, different options out there for um, working in, in geospatial land. Uh, we're pretty much, with the exception of a few things, using everything listed on the slide, either directly or under the hood. Um, we're not using PySAL, uh, Rosterio, or Cartopie. Those were um, I thought worth worthy of mentioning um, if you want to check those out and see if maybe they're a better fit for for your project. Um, otherwise, uh, I mentioned how certain packages wrap those functionalities of uh, GDAL and Ogre, um, which Fiona does. Uh, if you're wondering, um, Fiona is actually a Shrek joke because it um, it takes the functionality of Ogre and it. Um, she was the better looking uh, ogre who kind of softened, softened Shrek up by the end of the movie. Uh, so take what you will from that. Um, and uh, I mentioned Shapely, or I didn't mention Shapely, but it, I mentioned Geos, which it implements uh, under the hood of GeoPandas. So, um, and then visualization wise, uh, we are pulling um, uh, web tiles uh, for a background for our map from contextually, and we're gonna create an interactive map with Folium. Um, the other items are, are under the hood. All right, so um, let's jump over to some code. Uh, I need to uh, switch my screen here. So I'm gonna stop sharing.
All right. You guys see some uh, Jupyter notebook there? Yep. If you could make the type a little bit bigger. Yeah, definitely. Is that okay? Little, there we go. Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, we'll skim through this just to hit the high points here. Uh, I know reading someone else's code can be a little <laughs> um, tough to follow along sometimes. So uh, let's see. Uh, we import our packages. Um, I'm going to walk through just the JSON, uh, retrieving it and creating the geodata frame uh, because it takes uh, one extra step. Um, if you're importing directly from a shape file, then you can create the geodata frame immediately. You don't have to do this, this extra step uh, that we had to uh, finagle some of this JSON and uh, make it fit the, uh, the data frame format a little better. So I do um, an API call. Uh, this is the structure. Um, so we care about uh, this sites key, which has a list of objects. And each object uh, is, uh, has the keys and values uh, described here. So there's actually a lot of missing information. But what we care about is latitude, longitude, and the name um, from here. Uh, so that returns 69 dive sites within 75 nautical miles of Boston. Um, first, I create in Pandas uh, just a standard data frame. Uh, that's to get the data um, into a format that we can work with and then tell GeoPandas uh, Geo how to deal with that. So remember that the key with GeoPandas is this new geometry column, which will enable you to do the geospatial analysis and um, uh, with all the other <clears throat> functionality under the hood. So uh, this is, um, we're pretty much creating a geo data frame. So we take that temporary one up above. Um, and then the only difference here is we have to tell it where to find that longitude and latitude coordinates. And there's this nice method uh, points from x, y that um, will uh, convert the lat and longe into a geometric object um, known as the point. Uh, notice longitude is first. Um, longitude goes east to west. And so that's more analogous to an x coordinate. And that's why it's ordered that way. Um, we talked about a little about coordinate reference systems and how um, you need to know what you're working with. And uh, since this was web data, uh, I set, I have to set the CRS directly. Um, again, if you're working in other formats, uh, that's oftentimes built into your data. So you don't have to do this step, but it's really easy. So we set the attribute directly and we end up with this um, data frame that looks exactly like the other one, except um, all the way over to the right, if you can see it. Uh, it has these um, new geometry column with points made from the longitude and latitude of the, the set. Uh, oops. So double check the um, coordinate reference system. It's WGS84, so that worked. Um, Ruth showed us the info function earlier. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of missing data. Uh, we're gonna drop those columns. And you can see that GeoPandas has this new special data type called geometry, which it uses for that column. Um, this is just uh, data cleanup. I drop columns and um, uh, I add a, a, a point type called dive site just so I can combine it with the other data and, um, and know where it came from. Um, and then when I plot it, remember this is no projection and no background image. Uh, so plotting points just looks like any other scatter chart, uh, not very exciting. Um, so we're going to add uh, a web tile background and web tiles will always use um, the projection called web mercator, uh, which is a spherical mercator projection. Uh, and it uses the special 3857 code. Um, so we're using that two CRS method, um, which uh, converts just your geometry column uh, into the new projected data. Uh, so when we look at 
um, this new data frame, you can see that these point um, items, uh, the scale is totally different and the numbers are a little bit different. So it's done that projection for us. Um, but that allows us to pull a background map from the library called Contextly and plot all these points. So this is the visualization of the dive sites that are around Massachusetts. And you can see uh, a lot going on up here in the Gloucester area. Um, all right, then I did the exact same thing with the shipwreck data, which we're gonna skip. Uh, because it's a shape file, um, we were able to create the geo data frame directly. Um, so it's over here. Uh, check the CRS. Uh, note that we didn't have to set the coordinate reference system. It's already baked in. So that's kind of nice. Uh, WGS 84. Um, it's the same as the other set. So we can combine them. Um, a lot of missing data. So uh, I did some cleanup, dropped some columns, renamed things. Uh, there was one data point that mapped out in Lake Michigan. So <laughs> I, I dropped that one. And we end up with um, a nice uh, cleaner version of the data frame. Uh, we have 48 uh, data points. Uh, we do the same conversion to Web Mercator, uh, the same plotting of the background points. And you can see uh, these are the shipwrecks that were um, plotted. Uh, the, the one my small disappointment with this data set was that uh, I mentioned there were 3,000 wrecks off the coast of Cape Cod. Um, this stretch right here is the ocean's graveyard. And um, unfortunately, uh, there are only about 50 um, shipwrecks from the Wikipedia list that had coordinates. So uh, it's kind of underrepresenting that the danger zone of uh, the nautical world there. Um, so then I uh, combined the data frames and uh, I wanted to create a more exciting map. Uh, this map was, uh, these are, are static. You can't pan, you can't zoom, you can't really do much. Um, they just kind of display a certain way. So after combining the data sets, um, I used, uh, this is the Folium library, which is built off of a JavaScript uh, leaflet library. And um, it's really great for creating interactive maps where uh, you can do the pan and zoom stuff. Um, the, the one weird thing about it that we talked a lot about coordinate reference systems and, and making sure everything's on the same projection. Uh, with Folium, it's expecting your data in uh, latitude and longitude in unprojected data. So you don't do anything. You just leave it in WGS 84, uh, which is what it's expecting. So that's a little bit of a curveball after <laughs> after digging in through all that other stuff. Um, so we create a map. Um, uh, here's the code. Uh, it's pretty easy. You, you create a map uh, object and uh, specify where it's centered, um, which tiles you want to use. Um, and how zoomed in it is. Uh, then I loop over uh, the data frame, the geo data frame, and uh, I create um, a circle object for each dive site or rack um, within the, uh, the, the data frame. Um, and then I just color it using um, that column called point type. There was a, a helper function I skipped over. So, um, Dive sites are blue and shipwrecks are red in this map, just like the ones above. Um, and I created a marker for our pirate ship that we are all gonna uh, go diving for and recover those uh, missing gold coins. So the, the WIDA is this big marker. And this is what we end up with. Uh, you have a zoomable map that you can pan around. Uh, if you don't like the background, um, I specifically used a web tile that was kind of plain, so it didn't take away from the uh, all the data points. Um, but here's our shipwreck. And you can see, uh, if we really zoom in here, um, you can appreciate how close to shore it is. Uh, I think they was found in about 14 feet of seawater. Um, so that's pretty shallow for a dive. All right, so that is uh, the map. And one other cool feature with Folium is that 
uh, you can save the map with this dot save function and it'll export it as an HTML file uh, that um, has uh, your standard HTML and then the script to create your interactive map in JavaScript. So it's a really easy way to create a static um, web page file with an interactive map embedded in it. All right, so that was a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, if there are any questions, um, I'm gonna zoom out here. Um, and then for those interested, I did include a geocoding example. Um, we didn't really touch on that, but it's a common, uh, a common application when you have addresses or named entities and you want to look up the coordinates for it. Um, so I'll let, uh, I'll drop a link to uh, the code here in, in the meetup group. And if anyone wants to use this as a, uh, a reference, they can, they can dig through that. Right. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, it's clear that we sh we should have devoted an entire evening to this, I think. Um, and I, in particular, am fascinated by the idea of mapping. I spend a lot of time in maps these days because I am obsessive walker, uh, and I'm wondering how to put it all into a Jupyter notebook so that it's even geekier than it is right now. Um, do, yeah, well, there are lots of options for I, I visualizing. Can, and <laughs> I'm already overwhelmed. Um, do people have questions for Heather, other than how we can get our gold coins? Yeah, <laughs> bring a shovel with you. They're buried. <laughs> you can get all the gold coins you want with Advent of Code. I just got finished cool. doing a bunch of skiing. And I was using a, uh, a skiing tracking app that returns KML. And I just got introduced to it. So now I'm dying to stuff. Yeah, um, KML is, uh, it's a format from Google. Uh, so you'll find Google Earth and um, Google, uh, Google Maps API information, usually packaged like that. Uh, it's um, keyhole markup language. So it's, um, but yeah, you can, you can work with it in GeoPandas. Uh, it can be a little tricky if it has multiple layers to access everything, but that's one of the supported file formats that you can import directly and it'll, it'll find something, <laughs> yeah. And this could be a very interesting uh, project night focus uh, to have a GeoPandas room and people bring projects and, and learn more about this because it's clearly a very, a very deep dive let's just say. Yeah, when I was pulling my slides together, I was getting a little nervous on the 20 minute mark. Um, <laughs> so we, we definitely breezed over, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. But um, I think the best way to get started with this is just find uh, any data set online and, and dig into it. Uh, and then look up, uh, look up how to find uh, answers to things. Mm -hmm. um, no one else is chiming in, so I guess there's no questions. That's fine. Um, thank you very much, Heather and Ruth and Pete. Um, <clears throat> my, my focus in talks is always very code centric. I think it's very, it's kind of refreshing to see almost no code in the weather, uh, the weather talk, uh, and then get a lot of really good background on the GIS systems, uh, as well as that tasty crunchy code there at the end to, to prove that it can actually be done for real. Um, so thank you to all three of our presenters. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the event, I am always interested in helping people make presentations. Um, and I can help in any way you want from finding a topic to crafting an outline to reviewing slides. Um, I People generally, generally are glad they did it. And I think you would be glad you did it too. Um, and the 68 people who were here to watch these three talks, I know we're glad to have seen them. So it's a, it's a really good way to deepen your expertise and, and make some new friends at the same time.
Um, I have I have given talks at PyCon that I only knew half of the content when I proposed the talk to the PyCon talk committee. And when they accepted the talk, then I learned the other half as part of preparing the talk. So it's also just for yourself a really good way to learn more about the things you're you're you think you know. Let's put it that way. Um, okay, so um, thank you all for coming out. Um, stay safe in the snow. Remember, we are starting a new kind of Boston Python thing next week, Mondays at noon, uh, Boston Python office hour on Zoom. You can find it on about.bostonpython.com. You can find it on the Boston Python meetup page where there's an event for each Monday. Um, there's a link to the Zoom there. Um, I, I will be there. Other people will probably be there to help out with discussion and questions. We'll see how it goes. It's something to try, right? Any other comments or thoughts? No? All right. Well, thank you. See you on Slack. We'll have another project night early in January, and I'll be working on more presenters for another January presentation night. See you then. Bye, y'all. Hold on. <laughs>